Welcome back to this week's segment of 5 Minute Friday. It is a tea day. I am channeling my inner Brit. If you are from Europe, comment below. Tell me what kind of tea you drink. Let's start the clock. 5 minutes. Alright, today we are talking about a case study. So, I want to talk about dialysis. And that seems like such a boring topic, but let's say just at some point in my career, I had a 36 year old gentleman who is a known end stage renal patient who dialyzes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. He comes in on a Tuesday saying that he is short of breath, swelling in his legs, and hasn't been dialyzed in about a week. Cannot remember his last dialysis session, but says it was roughly a week ago. And on exam, he is in moderate respiratory distress. He is like sitting forward on the bed, tripoding. He is an obese gentleman. Uh, he has three to four plus lower extremity edema bilaterally. He even has some edema in his upper extremities. He is speaking in maybe three to four word sentences. His vital signs, his blood pressure is 250 over 130. His respiratory rate is about 25, 26 times per minute. His uh, temperature is 98.6. His oxygen saturation is 84% on room air. And he cannot recall his other medical problems, but he knows he has kidney disease. He has a graft to his left upper extremity that he gets dialyzed, uh, his dialysis doctor even works at your hospital where you're working. So that's kind of uh, the overall picture that you get whenever you get bedside report from a triage nurse, they bring him back to a room because his O2 sat's low. What are you thinking about? Pause the video, stop, I'm gonna take a drink of tea. Tell me what you're thinking. All right, so what's gonna be first? What are you gonna do first? So. Um, you really want to think about like ABCs first. So you want to address his airway. So first of all, is his airway patent? Um, if he's speaking, then chances are his airway is patent. He is on further exam. He is A and O times two. He is A and O to himself and to the place. He does not know the year. And some friend like dropped him off and let him go. And they had to like wheelchair him in. He was not able to walk on his own. So you get a little bit more history in that regard. Uh, again, on exam, he's 84% on room air with a good waveform. Um, uh, his cardiac exam, his heart rate, I didn't tell you his heart rate earlier, sorry, his heart rate is 50, sinus bradycardia. And um, he just looks sick, just doesn't look like he feels very well, and is obviously struggling to breathe. So that's a little bit about his exam. Um, kind of think about like where you would start. and. Start with airway. Again, is airway's patent? He's talking to you. Um, how are his breath sounds? So he's got rails in his bases, kind of fluid overloaded sounding like in his chest, not really looking too hot. Uh, where do you go from there? What is your like primary intervention? So you really, again, want to address his breathing and put him on oxygen. So you can start out by putting him on two to three liters nasal cannula and just see what that does for him. See if that changes anything at all. So let's say you put him on three liters nasal cannula, he comes up to 90%. He's still breathing 25 times per minute. Think about what labs you wanna order. So uh, we'll order a CBC, we'll order chemistry, we'll order a BNP. We ask him, do you still make urine? No, I don't still make urine. So no urine. Um, what is one big test, like probably the most important test that you wanna get on somebody like this? If you're thinking EKG, you're right. Why? The question is why do you wanna get an EKG? Why is an EKG important? Think about that. An EKG is important because of one major electrolyte abnormality that you will see in end-stage renal patients. And that is what? What? Potassium, potassium certainly. Potassium will cause EKG changes, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, you will see EKG changes. What do you get with end-stage renal disease? What kalemia do you get? Hyperkalemia with end-stage renal. That's the big electrolyte abnormality that you have to worry about. So, I keep flinging these stupid things around. So when you think of hyperkalemia, what kind of EKG changes will you see? Everybody learns in nursing school, oh, the peaked T waves. 
yeah, you might see some T-wave changes. More than that, you're going to see bradycardia. And so you will see like junctional rhythm or bradycardia slow in the heart way, way down with big time potassium. So that's one thing to look out for. So on our patient, his heart rate's 50, sinus bradycardia. We do an EKG on him. He has some like hyperacute T waves, wouldn't call them peaked, but they're just like hyperacute. And on his labs, his CBC is kind of baseline for him. He is chronically anemic, his hemoglobin is seven. On his chemistry, we already talked about this. What do you want to look out for? Kind of two things here. So again, his potassium, what's the other one you want to look out for? That's something that might indicate he needs emergent dialysis. And that is his BUN. So if a patient is like super uremic, then that would be an indication for emergent dialysis. All right. So you have some studies back. His chemistry comes back. His potassium is eight. That's kind of high. His uh, other electrolytes or are kind of like baseline for where they normally are for this gentleman. His BNP is greater than 5,000. We also tack on a chest x-ray and he's got moderate to severe pulmonary edema. So this is your patient. What are you going to do? He's like sitting up in the bed. Um, he's not really tolerating the nasal cannula now. He's like sitting forward, like tripoding, really like looking to breathe. So what things do you want to do for him now? Now we go back to airway. Uh, as far as airway, what would be the next step up in escalating this guy to an additional airway or an additional airway adjunct? And that would be BiPAP. Now, let's put the brakes on. You can try a non-rebreather, but that's just going to lead down the road to something different. So put him on BiPAP. What does BiPAP do? So BiPAP will create positive airway pressure, bi-level positive airway pressure, what it stands for. So it will create, it will force air in and it will cause the lungs to expand. And so you will thereby decrease some of that pulmonary edema, help them to breathe a little easier with a BiPAP. Now, BiPAP on a patient like this will just buy you time. So the end stage for this game, for this guy, the end stage game for this guy is dialysis. It's ultimately what he needs because you think about the pathophysiology of this, the kidneys at a very basic level, their job is to control electrolytes and get rid of fluid. And so whenever they are not working, that fluid's just building up here. And so he's probably got 20 pounds of some, some odd pounds of fluid on him that needs to come off. And that's probably why everything is backing up all the way up to his head and he can't breathe. So he's on BiPAP. You got your EKG, sinus bradycardia, you have your electrolytes. What is of importance? So I think we said his potassium was eight. I can't remember what I said a second ago. Let's say his potassium's eight. It's changed if it wasn't eight initially. His potassium is now eight. What are you going to do about that? And, and why is that important? So you think about hyperkalemia. The biggest thing you worry about with any kind of kalemia is the heart because um, potassium will affect the heart. It will cause arrhythmia. It will cause eventually the bradycardia, which will turn into a wide complex rhythm that will eventually stop. And so potassium is of the utmost concern. What do you want to do to kind of temporarily and emergently get his potassium down? So we can do a little cocktail that if you're an ER nurse or a provider, or if you know anything about physiology, it will make very good sense to you. So we can give 10 units of IV insulin. Let's start with that. We get to the nurse, our fabulous ER nurse, best nurse in the department, by the way, we are at eight minutes and 22 seconds. So we are like blowing the time out of the water today. Let's say uh, our ER nurse starts an IV on him, draws the labs earlier. Now we have good access. So we're gonna give 10 units of IV insulin. Why? Are we giving it for his blood sugar? No, no. Why are we giving IV insulin to a end-stage renal patient? Let's think about that. So insulin will correct, temporarily correct the hyperkalemia. How will it do this? So insulin will shift potassium. So it will shift potassium into the cells. So instead of potassium floating around intravascularly, the insulin will shift potassium into the cell, thereby dropping your intravascular potassium to hopefully a normal level. The next drug we want to give is plus or minus on the D50. So if the patient's blood sugar is like 600, then we probably don't need to give the D50. Just give the potassium thereby decreasing intravascular potassium, shifting it into the cell and delaying in some sort of cardiac arrhythmia that could potentially kill the patient. A lethal arrhythmia, VTAC, VFib. All right, so let's say his blood sugar is like 80. 
you know, around normal. So we do give the D50. So when we give the 10 units IV insulin, it doesn't bottom him out and he goes into a coma. We give him the D50 to keep his sugar back up. The D50 has nothing to do with potassium. The insulin does. What is the other drug that we want to give? Calcium. So calcium gluconate. You can also give calcium chloride, but the literature recommends calcium gluconate. And so you can give one to two grams of calcium gluconate and that will, why do we do that? That's a good question for you to answer. Think about that. Why do you want to give calcium gluconate or calcium chloride? Why do you want to give calcium? So you give calcium to stabilize the cardiac membrane. And so calcium is very good at that. It will stabilize the cardiac membrane, thereby decreasing the potential for potassium to cause a lethal arrhythmia. Now, that calcium gluconate is good for about 30 minutes to an hour, so you're gonna have to redose the patient if you can't get them to their end destination of being dialyzed. Then you will redose the calcium gluconate Q 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, if you start to see more EKG changes. And a lot of the times, once you give the calcium, the potassium, the D50, you will see the heart rate come up and the rhythm change if it's like junctional, come back to sinus. And then once it wears off, you will start to see it kind of go back. So you kind of have to redose. And again, all of these are very temporary measures. This is not something that you can give and send the patient home. This is temporary to prevent like active death until you can get the patient to emergent dialysis or wherever that may be. If you have dialysis capabilities, then you'll do it. If you don't, then transfer the patient. So now that we've got the electrolyte abnormality corrected, let's think about um, the breathing situation. So he's got moderate pulmonary edema, very hypertensive. His kidneys don't work. What are some things you can do about that? So some of the literature suggests you can give a big whopping dose of Lasix, like 80 to 100 milligrams. I personally don't do that. You can sometimes stimulate the kidneys to like push a little bit of fluid out with that. Not something that I do, and I, I don't think that's something that's recommended in the literature. i do not not super up to date on that, but again, it's not a habit that where I work that people do. You can, however, start a nitro drip or a cardine drip. So if they're just super hypertensive and there's not a whole lot of pulmonary edema, you can start the cardine drip that will control their blood pressure, prevent hypertensive emergency, so end organ damage, a STEMI, a dissection, things like that, stroke. Uh, you can also start a nitro drip. So nitroglycerin, we think about that with more heart failure patients, but that's more of decreasing the preload, decreasing venous return to the heart, decreasing pulmonary edema. And so that's what you would do breathing wise in combination with BiPAP to channel the respiratory status of this patient. Um, so let's talk about now what the end goal is. So the end goal is dialysis. Call up your nephrologist and say, hey, I've got a patient with end-stage renal. He hasn't dialyzed in over a week. His potassium's eight. I've given him uh, you know, insulin D50, calcium gluconate. He had Brady at first. He's now back to sinus. Um, he's on BiPAP and moderate respiratory distress with fluid overload, x-ray shows pulmonary edema, et cetera. Go through the story. They'll say, okay, he needs to be dialyzed. So usually the first thing the nephrologist will want to know is what's potassium. And that kind of leads me into the next point. What are indications for emergent dialysis? So think about this acronym, A-E-I-O-N-U. A-E-I-O-N-U for emergent dialysis. So A is for acidosis. You're going to see metabolic acidosis with a pH less than like 7 or 7.1. That's an indication for emergent dialysis. A, E, E is for electrolytes. Again, potassium being the big electrolyte. If he's hyperkalemic, that's an indication for emergent dialysis. And not necessarily dialysis like right now, but sooner rather than later. So A, E, I, I being intoxications. So uh, you can use the, uh, the mnemonic slime to remember the intoxications that you worry about. And again, this is not super common, the intoxication thing, but you can remember by salicylates, lithium, isopropanolol, methanol, and ethylene glycol. And again, those that I've never emergently dialyzed anybody with an intoxication. So pretty rare, but board question, something that you probably need to know. A-E-I-O, O fluid overload. So pulmonary edema requiring BiPAP hypoxic, that would qualify for an emergent dialysis. So our guy kind of meets two of those criteria so far with his electrolytes, his potassium being high, and then being super fluid overloaded with a BMP greater than 5,000, moderate pulmonary edema, 84% on room air, requiring BiPAP, et cetera, that would qualify. So A, E, I, O, and U, last one being uremia. So uremia is not something we think about super often, but that would be the BUN. So this guy, let's say his BUN is like 125. So really anything over about 90 
is uremic. And so with uremia, it's basically urine in the body and because it's not being expelled. And so all of this uric acid, uremia, uh, ammonia, all of these toxins will like build up in the body and cause uremia. And um, I think textbook wise, you'll see like that glassy crystal skin or something of that nature. I've never seen that before, but uremia is indication for emergent dialysis. Usually, um, Nephrologists say over 80 to 90, that's, that's getting up there. And a lot of the times with uremia, you'll see a mental status change. So with our guy, he was ANO times two. So I guess he meets three of the criteria, uh, electrolytes, fluid overload, and uremia. So he needs emergent dialysis. So that's a little bit of a case study to take you through dialysis and kind of the indications. Oh my gosh, we are at 15 minutes. I cannot believe this. We should have turned this into a real full video. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. If you have questions about emergent dialysis, questions about the case, comment below. Thanks for watching, and I'll try to keep it to a shorter time limit next time. Have a good day.